which are bite-sized um, opportunities for professional learning. Um, we know you're professionals that are short on time, um, but still want to engage in the conversation. So with that, we're going to officially kick off and get started. Um, because we are a small group today, please feel free to unmute yourself when you want to speak and grab the mic. Um, this is really a culmination of several learning opportunities that we started um, last fall. And so we're going to do a little bit of reflecting back to move forward. But really, the goal for today's micro webinar was to synthesize and kind of bring together some of those key learnings and talk about how folks are applying some of the things that they've learned this year um, in this very, in this word of the year, right? Word of the past two years, uh, unprecedented time of hybrid, remote, um, and in-person instruction, or depending, or all three in one week, perhaps, um, masked and social distancing instructing, instruction, safety protocols, and um, a focus on social emotional learning and academics. We know that you guys have worn so many hats this past year, and we're excited to kind of bring together some of those learnings to talk about how schools might change moving forward um, for the better based on practices that might have been put in place for crisis management that are actually now best practices for um, student learning and student safety and student engagement. So with that, on behalf of the Center for Teaching Quality, my name is Jessica Cuthbertson. Um, my colleague Lori Nazarino is here as well in the room today. And we just welcome you. If this is your first experience, know that this is one of a larger series of offerings. So at the end of the session, we're going to encourage and share with you the CTQ Tube uh, YouTube channel where you can revisit all of the micro webinars dating back from last August to this point. Um, we love supporting schools and districts with per personalized professional learning and opportunities to leverage their collective leadership. So we have, this is just one of a larger stack of offerings. And these are some of the broad umbrella topics that CTQ offers um, support with. So if you have needs in your system for DEI, for engaging educators with how to facilitate learning um, in a virtual space, something we've all gotten much better at this past year, um, or again, that social emotional piece, those are three of the other strands that we provide learning offerings around. So we'd love to talk more with you if there's an interest in your district or local context for that. Um, if you're just joining us, welcome. Again, we're a small but intimate group, so feel free to unmute the mic at any point and ask questions as we progress through the day. So with that, um, I'm gonna do a quick little looking back to look forward and just kind of share from a, a 50,000 foot level some of the offerings that we provided this past year. And we're lucky and blessed enough to have a few of the facilitators that have joined us for past sessions in the room today to give us some updates on the status of learning occurring in their respective classrooms and schools. So we kicked off the year in August um, with a, or in September, I should say, with a session on InstaData, focusing on formative assessment and how the new normal has really um, provided some unique opportunities to look at formative assessment in a different way. We follow that up in October with some learnings around um, social emotional support for both students and for educators. So with a focus on stress management and self-care in particular, um, knowing that we all need to broaden our coping skills um, and our toolbox this past year because it's, it's tested both the system and us as individuals to the max. We then in, moved into later in the fall, a session called Zoomies and Roomies and um, a session facilitated by K-12 educators um, in the new year around new, to, new tools for the new year. Um, again, talking with educators from the elementary to the high school level around this hybrid instruction space. So how they're managing learning in virtual environments, in in-person environments, and then both simultaneously as well. And then in February, our last offering took that same kind of approach of um, interviewing and kind of getting a lay of the, the landscape from the school leadership perspective. So the creative things that school leaders are doing at the district or school level um, in roles such as principal, assistant princi principal, assistant instructional coaches, um, district curriculum folks, how those roles have shifted and responded in um, as a result of the needs of kids in this setting. So that's just kind of a brief um, walk down memory lane. And with that, um, I'm gonna introduce you to a few of our breakout room facilitators today. 
um, who are in the room with us. If we can, and I'm kind of basing it on my screen here, um, if we could hear from a couple school leaders first. So Craig Washington, can you share with us a little bit more about your role and um, your current state of spring break and how your building has managed learning this year? Well, um, I think there are connectivity issues there. Yeah, Craig, your connection. I think we're, we're losing your. We're losing you a little bit. Zoom and connectivity issues. There you go. We've all experienced them this year. <laughs> Jessica, <laughs> you want to? I'm confident that, to we somebody else? Hear, that we will hear amazing <laughs> words from wisdom from Craig Washington in a minute, not quite yet. <laughs> he has the opportunity to hopefully um, move closer, relocate to a little bit stronger Wi-Fi. Um, I'm going to pass the baton to, to two of our classroom educators. <clears throat> So we have both Sally Ortman and Chris Cole in the room. Uh, today, Sally is a high school teacher and Chris teaches sixth grade. And they actually teach on two different, two very different time zones, two different coasts. Um, Chris led our InstaData session on formative assessment. Chris, do you mind unmuting and introducing yourself and just talking a little bit about what are some kind of high, high level things that you, that have evolved in your practice with respect to formative assessment since you facilitated last fall to now. Sure. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, Chris Cole. I teach uh, sixth grade, like Jessica said, in Southern California. Um, the biggest evolution for me that I feel like has kind of already been brought to the fore here is around, uh, I, I used to assess for content and what kids know and don't know so that I could make groups and differentiate accordingly. And my assessment this year has been uh, almost completely focused on like the social emotional aspects for kids and what they're bringing into the physical classroom or the virtual classroom every day. Um, in addition to the obvious of what's happened this year, um, our community has also had a lot of turmoil. Um, there have been a series of wildfires that have forced students and families out of their homes and either into hotels or to other parts of the state um, while those fires are being fought. Um, so, you know, layered on top of all the obvious was another big thing for our local community. And so uh, kids kind of bringing a lot of trauma uh, into class every day. And so managing that and just knowing, having a sense of, of exactly what they're bringing into their day and then how to manage trying to learn. Um, some days I tossed the learning out and we just had fun. We just did games and puzzles because that's what kids needed. They needed to, to reconnect and feel safe and comfortable. Um, and actually, as a school community, we're talking about doing that again next year um, and not like a day or two a week, um, but really reconnecting to our community, um, given how it's been sort of torn apart for about the last year. And then, you know, it's not going to be another about another six months before we feel like we're back together again uh, and complete the way that we were before all of this got started. Uh, and so a lot of the, the work I've been doing in my classroom, I'm now trying to translate to kind of a, a school wide level and what, what might it look like for us to assess what kids are bringing to the classroom, what's going on at home, um, and what are the proper supports that we can put in place. Um, since we, we don't have a counselor, we share one with two other schools. Um, and so really teachers are the counselors of, of first resort around here. So um, putting another hat on um, in addition to all the other obvious ones we wear. So it's been a wild year. Um, 
I don't know if I traded in for anything because I've learned a whole lot um, and it's it's been worthwhile. Thank you, Chris. I'm channeling all my early childhood mentors when who I who I know would say that just playing yeah. and just doing games and right and yeah. learning for fun. That is learning, right? Yeah. If we're not having fun and we're not playing and we're not engaged in some games, I'm not sure we're that doing. that's that's not the best maybe form of learning. So I think yeah. you you got your priorities straight for sure. Um, Sally, will you share a little bit with us about what you shared in January with respect to sort of the evolution in your high school science classroom and where that sits right now in the spring? All right, so um, what I shared um, a couple months ago was about using um, some things to do digital station rotations um, through something like link or you could um, make it in a Google slide as well. My classroom before COVID was we're doing a lot of, of different things and I wanted to uh, maintain the integrity of a lot of those lessons, um, but we could not really be in groups and have a lot of physical stuff to touch. Can y'all hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? Am I correctly? Or am I? Okay. Um, and so I wanted to, to keep doing that. And so I found a couple ways to do that. And um, change the physical stations that we would get up and rotate around to and, and have a bunch of manipulatives. Manipulatives, I changed that into something that was completely digital and the students could work at their desk um, through and they did have the option to either do it themselves or um, hop on the same Google Doc with a person sitting close to them and collaborate and work together. So we didn't completely lose that collaborative aspect of it. Um, it was a way to continue to power through a lot of the content that we would cover in a station rotation, add reviews, add fun videos. Um, I did have to, for some of them, make a lot more manipulative so that each kid could have their own if that was part of the station. And it's just been a really great thing to use and I could see myself continuing to use those items for the digital station rotation, even when we are outside of a, a COVID world. But again, a lot of this could be slightly tweaked um, when everything was a little bit safer to work in groups and work a little bit closer, um, could tweak those to going back to being hands-on activities as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, Ernie Rambo, a National Board Certified Teacher from Nevada. Um, while she hasn't recently facilitated a micro webinar for CTQ, um, Ernie has a longstanding relationship with CTQ and was doing virtual facilitation with both adults and kids before it was a thing, like long before COVID, before it was a thing, right? That we're all doing. So Ernie, would you mind introducing yourself and just talking about um, what instruction has looked like for you this past year in Nevada? Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel really good about myself because of that nice introduction. So I appreciate it. Um, a lot of my work, I'm retired from 30 years of, of middle school classroom teaching. And so in the past four years, I've been working with developing, sustaining teacher leadership in Nevada, and in particular, national board certified uh, candidates to become national board certified teachers. So our role uh, this past year you know, I, I used to be the lady who knew a lot more about Zoom than all the other teachers, but within a week, that credibility just went out the door because <laughs> suddenly teachers were, knew how to use it with their students, and it, there were some shifts there. But uh, I've heard several phrases that are resonating well with what we've been doing in Nevada. Um, I'm in Las Vegas, uh, but we've been definitely focusing on supporting our teachers, any teachers across the country as they move through this uh, brave new world, so to speak. Um, definitely learning how to communicate with teachers. It used to be an email was good as gold, uh, but I'm discovering texting is going to get through because our teachers are getting so many emails from parents, from students, from administrators. It, it goes on. So just learning how to be flexible, uh, how to not introduce too much new technology. On the other hand, sharing some ideas that uh, can transfer into each teacher's practice um, with different tools and such. Um, it, it's been a year, I'll say that. And uh, I'm just, it's overwhelming. 
to see what our teachers have learned to, to recognize this shift and the impact it will have on our nation is, is where I'm coming from. So I'm happy to be here and thanks. And I think you, we have a cat meow ditto to that, right? Like that's, <laughs> even our pet, our get, our pets get to participate in professional learning too. Um, before we transition to the the heart of our conversation, um, I I see Craig was able to rejoin. Let's let's check sound and Craig, if you're if you're game to try to introduce yourself one more time um, and tell us a little bit about your role as a school leader in South Carolina and some things that your school has been trying. Um, we'll. May the Zoom force be ever on your side. Shucks. <laughs> I think Craig's frozen. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Uh, I'm principal of Columbia High School. Once again, I'm glad to be so close. Okay. So again, Craig is a principal from Columbia High School, uh, from Columbia, South Carolina, if you didn't um, <laughs> catch that. And his school has been doing some really um, innovative things around approaching their learners. They have a high special ed population. Um, and he had just, was just sharing with us that they've allowed some choice around whether kids want to come back in person or remain um, remote and kind of juggling those two worlds based on student preference and student need. So they've had to do a lot of shifting to meet the needs of their specific um, population in this new normal. Um, so hopefully you will get to hear more from Greg. We'll try again later. Um, we don't give up easily. Um, right for now, um, I'd like to segue us into kind of the heart of the conversation and give our participants. So Julie, Libby, Karen, Dana, um, opportunities to engage with any or all of our, our facilitators. And we were going to look at this through two lens. Since we're a small group, I think we're going to stay here versus kind of do our breakouts, but know that Regardless of our role, if you're working in an administrative type role, you're going to think through the lens of what does leading forward look like um, as we move into planning for next school year, if we can believe it, it's already late spring. Um, and what does teaching forward look like if you're in a classroom based role. So the protocol will actually be the same regardless of your role. So I think it makes sense for us to stay together as a group and sort of the frame for this conversation. But again, we're small. So feel free to um, this is casual, feel free to grab the mic and go off script if the, the spirit moves you, but we'd love for everyone to brainstorm kind of around this three, two, one um, protocol, starting with three. So you heard a little bit from our facilitators around shifts they've made in their practice. We would love to hear from the whole group via the chat box or feel free to grab the mic um, or both. And if you put something in the chat box, just know that we might encourage you to grab the mic and share a little bit more. Um, but I'll give you a minute of think time. What are some three teaching or leading practices, or they might be both depending on your role, um, or processes that you or your team or your school or your district, you can think across levels, will continue from this school year. So again, maybe something that started out of necessity um, or crisis management, or just because that was the way you were told things were going to happen, but it actually ended up impacting your, cross, your practice and you will carry that forward next year, um, regardless of the context. Um, what are those three things that, that you tried that you're going to hold on to for next year? And I'm going to mute and give you a minute of think time and would love to have folks grab the mic or start populating the chat around. Uh, I'll jump in quickly with what I know is the challenge that we're beginning to tackle now, even though it's going to take a while to figure out what to do with it. Um, we have a huge population that's been home since March of 2020. Um, they are going to continue with our online academy through the end of the school year. They'll be at home all summer. Um, and so that's about 18 months where they've been scared um, either themselves or by their families, you know, Going to the outside world, going to school, going to the market has been a scary place for them. And then we're going to welcome them back in August. And so what is it going to be like for about half of our student population to be 
first of all, back on campus when they haven't been in so long? Um, what's it going to be like for them to be back on the playground when they haven't had those kind of interactions for 18 months? Um, and then the hardest one that we're trying to figure out is what's it going to be like for them to be back in public spaces every single day when for a pretty big chunk of their upbringing now, they've been isolated at home. Um, so we're, and again, we're doing this with a one third of a counselor um, who's stretched given her workload already. And so we're, you know, we have some time before this plane takes off. Um, so we want to build it as best we can, but that's the, the biggest challenge for us is how do we, how are we going to be integrating all of these different needs that students are going to be bringing um, relative to students who have been on campus this year, um, some who have been in the hybrid system. So we have kind of three different types of student coming back full time next year, and we're going to be expected to make it work equally well for all of them. Um, so that's the, that's the challenge. Um, and I'll stop and get to the other two a little bit later, probably in the chat window. So I guess um, I'll share. I'm Libby Ortman, and um, I work at the um, State Department of Ed, 30-plus uh, year middle school. So um, Ms. Rambo over there, I can definitely um, understand that love for middle school. Um, so I guess I'm thinking I lead mainly um, work around collective leadership in our schools, working with teachers and administrators as well as um, I coach first year principals and work with the micro-credential academy. So things look quite differently. We usually do all of our modules face-to-face. -face. Um, it's a full day, nine to four. We partner with CTQ in that work. And um, three things that I definitely think that we will keep, um, the virtual sessions have been amazing. We um, did not adapt, but we totally recreated what those um, sessions look like from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, and we found that more people participated because they weren't having to get subs, they weren't having to travel, they weren't having to cover each other's classes, so that's definitely a win. Also, just looking at modifying the entire um, agenda, we had always, I not Lori, I had already always packed more than could possibly get done. And when we went to totally virtual and we only wanted to have buckets about 90 minutes, um, um, three 90 minute sessions across the day, we really had to learn less is more. I definitely wanna keep less is more. We go deeper instead of so far out. And then, um, the principals that I work with, first year principals, they really have liked the virtual site visits. Um, they love being able to do it anytime, any place. Normally I went to their schools and they had to stop what they were doing, find a place for us to sit down and talk. But this way, no matter where they were, if they were transitioning, we could still have our 30 to 45 minute conversation. So virtual sessions, we'll keep um, as many as we can, modified, um, agenda, definitely. And then we really like those virtual site visits. Thank y'all for letting me share. Thank you, Libby. All right, I'll go. I've gotten some items. Let me put it here in the chat box so y'all can see what I'm talking about. Okay. I've, um, one number two is is school wide that I think we'll keep, and then the other two is just me. Um, so the first one is a late work document. I know with the the craziness of how everything has been in schools, um, teachers have been asked to you know if you've been asked one time to extend grace for for something due, you've been asked a thousand asked a thousand times. And I'm I've always been fine with that. Obviously, when teaching honors or, or AP, you have to be a little bit more you know strict on some of those due dates. Um, but where I found was a problem for me was that I couldn't keep up with who was turning in what, when, um, and so what I've done is I have conditioned all of my classes to 
when they turn something in after it's already been entered into the grade book, they can see, you know, maybe they didn't get a grade for that or it says it's missing and they go back and do it. They have to fill out this late work um, Google Doc or Google form for me so I know what to go look for. They might turn in five things. So however many times you have to fill out that document um, so that it populates for me to, to go look at it, um, that's what they do. And that's been really helpful. Um, the second thing is what my school calls a WAG, and that's going to stick around a week at a glance. And instead of writing everything on the board, like we used to write our, like we used to, like it's only been a year ago, um, used to write the agenda and what you were doing for the day. And um, the students get it at the beginning of the week and everything they need for that particular session, um, that class is there, hyper they are able to just click that and get all the documents that they need and see any upcoming homework. They can see everything that's there. And so um, that's going to stick around. I really like that. It's easy to create that and forces me to be ready for the whole week on Monday instead of just one day at a time. Um, that's also been really good for kids in quarantine. They have everything there that they need. Um, and then the last thing that's going to stick around for me is summative assessment eligibility. We've really gotten down to, okay, what are the important things that have to go in a grade book that correlate with our, um, like our science performance standards? What do they have to be able to do? And it really cut down on any of the other just, oh, I need to, to give them a grade kind of thing. And so the, the students have um, the document with all of the assessments that are going into the grade book. And in order to take the summative assessment, in order to be eligible for it, they have to have completed all of the formative assessments leading up to that. So holding them accountable for the learning is really the important part and really been the push of our new leadership this year. Um, it doesn't do them any good to have that due date, you know, in September and then they don't turn it in until October. Well, that, you know, they, they got rid of that hole in the grade book, but then that learning wasn't helpful when they took the test. And so holding them accountable to get those formative assessments done before the summative has been helpful um, and helping them do better on the test and has also cut down on the number of retakes. Our district has a lovely retake policy. Um, so getting them prepared before the, the summative assessment has definitely cut down on that uh, retake work as well. Thank you, Sally. Feel free to continue to engage and share um, some takeaways, some things that you're moving forward with. Uh, we are going to move on to our second question, which has already been touched upon in a lot of different ways, but digging a little bit deeper into this supporting vulnerable students in particular. So we'd we'll love to hear again from that whole child, the social emotional lens and, and whole person actually, because um, again, <laughs> it's really, really hard to take care of our students if we're not also taking care of ourselves um, or, or working on some strategies to uh, like, yeah, my, my son is the best emotional regulator reminder for me, right? Like he's usually cueing me, mommy, take a breath, right? I had no idea that like what went into breathing, but um, I did see that um, Ernie dropped that, right? Like as a takeaway, we all need to breathe a little bit more moving forward. So what are some ways that you have um, or are planning to support particularly um, our most vulnerable students and take care of yourself moving forward as a result of some lessons learned this year. This is Craig Washington. Uh, wanted to just chime in and say that one of the things that we did at Columbia High is that we did a uh, questionnaire, some surveys, just to see what was uh, concerns for the staff and also concerns for the students. We collected that data and from that data, we could see that our staff was having trouble sleeping. Our staff was having trouble uh, concentrating. Um, they were concerned about their family. Uh, so it definitely made me take another look at how I approach my staff members. Um, for our students, we had students that were concerned about where they were gonna get their next meals. Um, we had students that had also concerns uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, being lonely, uh, how are they going to keep up with their work, the, uh, the vast amount of work they were being given, 
So we were able to sit down as a staff and kind of talk about, you know, what could we do to support not only um, each other, but also our students. I'll say from the staff side, we opened up a uh, room just for them to go in, relax, um, you know, kind of uh, an area where they could get coffee, get a snack, but just an opportunity for them to relax. For our students, what we wind up uh, putting in place is two uh, periods. We uh, designate just for that social emotional learning opportunity. And that really has made a big difference to address some of those needs and those concerns. Our teachers push forward those social emotional uh, lessons that were created by guidance counselors, but we're trying to do as much as we can to stay connected with our students, whether in person, Thank you, Craig, and thanks for hanging in there with your audio video connection. We heard you heard you clearly um, appreciate that. Appreciate that so much. Um, and I think that the, the end of the thought was whether in person or online, um, I'm inferring there. Um, other, thank you for sharing from the school leader perspective. Other things folks are doing to support our most vulnerable students. I'd like to jump in, um, <clears throat> even though retired, I, I'm learning a lot about teaching. <laughs> so uh, one of my colleagues has been instrumental uh, in helping me explore um, equity in particular, but also inclusive and uh, just a lot more to go a lot broader than I think um, that we used to in the classroom. And what she always reminds me is to focus on our students' assets, focus on the family's assets, and start there when building. And it's it's so true because in developing genuine relationships with families, rather than just calling and saying, juniors two years behind grade level on his reading levels, um, let's look at what junior's doing well and really start there and get to know the family, get to know more about the family. And I think it really helps to develop more of a, of a team approach toward education, if you will. So to me, that, that's really important. Um, and so I kind of tied those two together in my answer. I love that you said the team approach because I feel like if anything, that is the way uh, we've made it through COVID is utilizing that team approach. Uh, you know, we've, used, we've been used to as educators working in a silo and that silo approach is not going to work for us. but with COVID is really forced. And I could say for my team, it's forced us to really come together, to really share best practices, to really talk about uh, struggles, to really talk about uh, strategies that would help support uh, student learning. And also just to talk about kids in general. Um, if we notice a change in a student, uh, one teacher notices a change, uh, another student, another teacher may say, yeah, I'm noticing that same change. How do we collaborate and how do we focus on um, helping to support that student? Um, and it's bringing us together, it's brought us together. I don't want that to change just because we're coming out of COVID. I want us to maintain that connection, maintain that connection of sharing, um, maintain that connection of collaborating and working together. That's the only way we're gonna change that narrative for our students and, and be successful as educators. And I think it reduces that stress for us. It really reduces that stress when we work together. I think we're all hoping that the silver linings um, that were learned again in a time of crisis are things that um, everyone, the larger community, right, from our policymakers to our parents and families um, and, and just community members in general won't forget, right, when things go back to normal, whatever that means. I think, you know, many ways the spotlight was more brightly shown on how normal was not, was imperfect. Normal was flawed and normal was not working for many students and staff. Um, we had teacher retention issues and burnout issues and stress issues and social emotional needs and mental health needs um, long before 
COVID struck. Um, and so now I think that there's just a more national, there's a national spotlight and understanding um, on some of the very real equity access um, issues that schools had already been dealing with, um, but are now a little bit more public. And so hopefully we can leverage that, um, that public knowledge for the greater good. And with that, um, I think we're gonna close with some with with a note on challenges. So um, the the one in the three two one protocol is, what's something that's still <laughs> only one? Notice it's only one. Um, we know there's probably many things keeping you up at night. Um, what's the one thing that's mostly keeping you up at at night right now, um, moving forward? And a little bit, this is this is data and fact finding for us here at CTQ. Um, we really we believe in personalized professional learning and really providing opportunities that. Um, meet the needs of educators and the system, regardless of what's going on. And so um, we're considering this a bit of a formative assessment question for us as well. So we'd love to hear in the chat, um, or feel free to grab the mic again, um, what is that one challenge for which you're still searching for a solution um, moving forward? And then we'll, we'll close for the afternoon. I gotta say for me, um, one of the things that I wanna make sure that, that I, I'm still looking for a solution for is making sure we never lose sight of any student. Um, we've got so many students that have uh, a number of needs. It's how do we maintain a system in place to where we don't ever lose sight of any student? That is the thing that keeps me awake at night. Um, and that's the thing I worry about is what can I do to make sure that every student uh, gets what they need, that we're able to intervene on time and provide them the support that they need? Uh, so that's a fear for me as an administrator and as a leader, and I'm sure others share that. You just don't want to lose any kid. Other lingering challenges, feel free to put them in the chat or grab the mic, kind of last call for share. All right, I can just um, add to that. I, I call them the lost kids. Like what What do you do with it? Um, I've had a couple of lost kids this year and you know, you, you email and then they don't answer and then you call and that doesn't work and you don't have the right number. And um, I don't know why I didn't think of it first and we don't train just to, to look at this, at least I don't at my school go down the entire contact list that's in power school or whatever your school uses. I mean, I ended up calling a grandmother and the grandmother was like, yeah, they, she just told me this weekend that school's been great. And I'm like, well, I haven't seen her all semester. So there's that, um, you know, so utilizing all of your resources, you don't just have to call the first two numbers, you know, listed in power school. If there's eight numbers listed, call all eight. And so I've just been, um, I'm just kind of relentless at my school and they know I'm going to, uh, to, to beat everyone's door down looking for my lost kids. And then, um, you know, we talked earlier about that team approach. And that is one um, thing my school has done well this year is everyone's in teams, administrators and guidance counselors are on teams. So if you are in the 10th grade and your last name is A through whatever, this is your guidance counselor and this is your administrator. So when trying to take care of a kid, we email the whole team. Um, to try to help you our school has even done um, wellness checks like going to the actual houses um, to to put a face on the kid but I know that we as a school can only do so much so I think you know at, and I don't know what the fix is but it would be great if there was some other community entity um, that was able to help us look for those last, lost kids because the community will be the first ones who say well what did y'all do with the lost kids well it'd be great if we could have some help tracking them down it's really hard to educate the ones we have in the building while also looking, you know, relentlessly for the ones that aren't there. So that's what keeps me up at night. But what helps me sleep is that I know that I annoy everyone on the, the contact list until I get some type of news. <laughs> Keep up the good fight. That's right. And if anything, I think hopefully our collective appreciation for face-to-face -face interaction or at least virtual face-to-face -face interaction, again, will hopefully shine the spotlight on 
um, educators should never have been doing this work isolated in classrooms, right? Like that, that um, the reimagining schools as community driven um, centers of learning um, and centers of services is, is a real need um, that again pre-existed COVID, but hopefully now is more widely understood by all. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, we're going to close with some asks of you moving forward. Um, so one is we would love it if you would complete our feedback survey, because again, um, in the spirit of personalized professional learning and collective leadership and continuous improvement, we are constantly trying to um, tweak and refine and revise and expand our offerings to meet the needs of the field. Field, so that would really um, we would really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, you are in the leading forward uh, session, so that's what you will select on the drop down menu there, and would love your feedback. And then finally, um, if this, if this is your first opportunity to engage with us, again, welcome, and we hope it will not be your last. And if you're um, a familiar face in our uh, network, we hope to continue to engage with you in some new and exciting ways. So we just refreshed our website and would love for you to head over to there and check it out. You all found yourselves in this micro webinar, so that means you're already on um, our e-news and e email distribution list. So you should be getting updates from us regularly. Um, but as mentioned, the CTQ2 houses all of the micro webinars that, um, kicked off with Chris Cole's Instadata offering last September. So if you were, if your interest was piqued by something that one of our facilitators said today and you wanna learn more deeply about their work in their respective context, we encourage you to go back and visit that archive um, and check out um, what station rotation looks like in Sally's classroom um, or some of the tools that Craig's using with his, his team as mentioned. Um, so visit the CTQ tube and check out our past offerings. They're there for your viewing pleasure at your leisure in your pajamas or where, whenever you do your online professional learning. And then last but not least, if you're not already following us on social media, we, we would love for you to follow us and, and engage with us there and, and um, would love for you to actually tweet out about today and some things that you'd like to see from us and we'll engage in conversation there. So we're on Twitter at Teaching Quality. You can also find us on Facebook and on LinkedIn. Um, and with that, we just really appreciate you spending um, a chunk of perhaps your spring break, and if not, your very busy professional schedule with us in learning today. Um, I'm gonna sign off from CTQ, but we will stay online for any lingering questions, um, last minute asks, and a round of applause to our facilitators today. Thank you so much for sharing your practice.